You know how it is, habits. But uh, it's good to see everyone tonight in the Lord's house. Uh, for our Wednesday night service, everything's so different, I've got to watch what I say here. You know, when you've been saying the same thing for years, you've got to be careful. But I appreciate y'all's faithfulness tonight and being in God's house. And uh, I pray that uh, what I present tonight will be of uh, some help to you. And, you know, it's not going to be anything new, of course, if most of y'all, y'all have very familiar with the Word of God. And the subject tonight, we're going to look at the doctrine or act of God that is called justification. And so we'll get into this study uh, in, of, on justification, but first... You know, there might be some questions. That word justification, that's one of them big words, and we'll see a few more here tonight. Don't need this here right now, do I? But uh, it's a big word, justification, and uh, we'll see what it means for us tonight. But, you know, you might even ask, who needs justification? And we'll talk about that tonight. The short answer is all humans born upon this earth need justification. Then the question might be, why? Why do we need justification? And we'll see tonight in the scriptures as we study. We'll be in the book of Romans. We'll begin in chapter 3. Let me go ahead and not used to that. But uh, Romans chapter 3 is where we'll begin. We'll teach out of there. We'll teach out of chapter 5. And uh, we'll be over in the book of Psalms and also in the book of Ephesians. But predominantly our lesson is going to come from Romans 3 and chapter 3 and chapter 5. But the short answer for why is because uh, all men are sinners before a holy God. So we need to be justified for that reason. And uh, just so you didn't misunderstand me there, that includes you and me. We'll begin in Romans chapter 3, verse 9. And, you know, I could start it anywhere here in the book of Romans. Romans is... It's one of those books, you know, the Word of God talks about uh, getting off the milk and getting on to the meat. And Romans is a meat book. It's, it's, some, it's some, some beef. And so some, some things in here, it's a lot of important things being said in the book of Romans. And this justification thing is part of uh, Paul's teaching here. We'll begin in verse 9, and uh, it's sort of an odd place to begin, but we'll have to back up and talk about it a little bit. Verse 9 says, what then? So Paul asks a question, what then? Are we better than they? And he's talking about the Jews themselves here. Uh, and he had discussed that previously between the, the Gentiles and talked about how they were sinful people and they needed God. And then he talked about the Jews and their responsibilities. But he says, what then? Are we better than they? In other words, are the Jews better than the Gentiles? He answers, no in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. You know, you're going to see that word all a lot uh, in tonight's lesson. But all is a, a, a big word if you get right down to it when we get into our lesson here. Let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Pray God will bless this uh, lesson tonight. Dear Lord, we come together here tonight thanking you for this opportunity to open up your word. And we pray, Lord, your blessing upon what we say tonight, Lord. Help me, Lord, as I speak, that I'll speak your truths. And, Lord, that, I, that what I say would be a help and be the truth, Lord, that you would have for me to say it here tonight that would be a help to the people, Lord. Pray for our pastor up there in Virginia, Lord. Be with him and give him safety and bless him, Lord, and bless that meeting. And, Lord, for all these requests, Lord, that was mentioned, we pray, Lord, for your healing upon them and your touch, God, from on high. We know you can, Lord, and we lay them in your hands. Pray, and thy will be done. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So we read here in verse 9 of chapter 3, Paul says that uh, what then are we better than they? He says, no in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. So as I said, Paul been speaking of the Gentiles' depravity in the previous chapters. And, you know, and that's the thing about it. You know, I can talk about other people and what I was wrong with. Them. You could probably do the same thing about me. I could point at you and say, well, this is what you ain't doing right. It's what you need to improve upon. It's always easier to see other people's faults. It's never as easy to see our own faults. 
And that's one of the things that we all need to do, and that sort of touches upon our lesson tonight. But Paul here pointed out the responsibility of the Jews previously. You know, the Gentiles, they knew God through nature and, and, and these types of things. But the Jews knew God through the covenants and the promises and the, the lineage that God had handed down through Abraham throughout the years. And he gave them the responsibility to present God to the world. That's why he chose the Jews. He chose them not for any other reason, not because of anything they had done, but he chose them that he would separate a people that would present God to the rest of the world. Now they failed in that, as we know, and that's why he had to come himself to this earth. But he, uh, they were to present God and his mercy and God's grace to all men. Paul points out here that Jews are in reality just as sinful as Gentiles. You know, and that's something that some of us might want to look at. You know, we might, I'm a Baptist, I'm better than, uh, than uh, that Methodist and all that, and I believe I am, but that, that's a different story. But, uh, you know, that's just it. We can all look at somebody else and think we're better than they are. And that was one of the problems with the Jews. The Jews are really a, a proud and arrogant people, if you get right down to it. And, and especially in this day, as we even see this in the scriptures and the gospels, the arrogance of the Jewish people over the rest of, of the world. But the reality is, Paul's making it very clear, you're just as sinful as the Gentiles. In other words, they're all under sin. That's what he says in the latter part, uh, part of that verse, that they are all under sin. Then we read verses 10, 11, and 12. I'm going to read them together, and there's a reason for that, but let's go ahead and read them. It says here in verse 10, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 11 says, There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Verse 12 says, They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So, I highlighted uh, in my speech there these words that are seemingly small words that we might pass by as we read that because they're just little two-letter and three-letter words, but they are very critical in these scriptures. And the reason I read those three together, we, uh, what's the first thing he said there in verse 10? As it is written. In other words, Paul said, uh, I can take you over to the book of Psalms and tell you what God had to say about this matter, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Psalms chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. And uh, we'll jump back and forth here a little bit in this uh, sense here. But we read verse 1 of chapter 14 of Psalms. It says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. And then he, it, the scripture says, They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. And that highlights back to verse 10 there where he said there's none that doeth good. We look here in Psalms at the beginning there, it talks about the fool. The fool uh, has said in his heart. You know, and that's important. When a man says something in his heart, that's in the deepest part of his being, so to speak. You know, it's more than just this physical uh, organ here we're talking about here. We're talking about in his inner being. He says in his heart, in his whole nature, his whole being, that there is no God. You know, and that's here in the scriptures. And there are many fools in the world by this definition. There's many people in the world that deny God. It says here also that they are corrupt. Uh, here in Psalms. They are corrupt. In other words, they are uh, heading down a pathway without a destination. And then we say, why are they corrupt? They reject God, obviously, in what we're reading here. And what that means is they have no compass in their life. They have no direction in their life. You know, God created this universe. God created human beings. He created them for a purpose. You can go back over to Genesis and read about that. He created us, and He, he is the compass. He has always been in our consciousness, so to speak given us a guidance. Mankind has always had God in their consciousness. And they can choose to put him out. You know, there's a lot of things I can put out of my mind, so to speak. And that's what these people have done. But when you do that, you lose direction in your life. You lose understanding of what life truly is because God created this life and he's the one that's the author of this life. 
So he's the one that will give us the guidance in this life and what it's supposed to mean. And then we read here that uh, they have done abominable works. That goes back to them being corrupt. And it says, there is none that doeth good. Well, you know, let me ask you a question. Uh, do you know anybody who does good? Your definition of good? Well, yeah, I'm sure we all could probably say, well, you know, there's a lot of people who do good in this world. I try to do good myself, you might say. But what is the definition of good there? You know, we all like to think about uh, ourselves doing good, and we even see others and appreciate others supposedly doing good. But the question arises to me, why do people do good? Well, for some, they're doing good is for their self-glory, so they'll be highlighted and uh, uh, applauded and, and praised for their actions. Some do it for earthly gain, and that, again, goes back to that self-glory. You know, we could talk about that for uh, a long time, about why people do good. But then we ask the question, what is good? What does it mean by good here? Good to man is different than good in God's eyes. You need to understand that. You know, we want to uh, dumb down words so much because we as human beings cannot put our vocabulary on the level of, of what God is sometimes meaning and saying. So we put it on earthly terms. There's an earthly good, and then there's the heavenly good. And what we're talking about here is the heavenly good. And by that, ones who are truly righteous, you might say. So we see here that there's a different meaning here to this good. We see in verse 2 of Psalm 14, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Over here in verse 11, you read there, it said, There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. So, you know, these are not direct quotes of Psalms, but it's the, in, it's the basic sayings of what is being said here. So the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men. You know, God's always looking down upon us. He sees every heart. Even those people that he called fools in verse 1, he's looking down. He knows what's in their heart. That's why he could say, they said in their heart, there is no God. He knows what people are thinking, what their, their minds are about, what their lives are about. But he looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. So we see here in verse 2 of Psalm 14, the question is asked, do any understand? This speaks to man's mind. Does man have God in his mind? Is he in their minds? And then he says, uh, in the second part of that verse, and seek God. Do any seek God? This goes back to man's heart. A man's heart has to yearn. You know, when my heart uh, was yearning for my wife, it was seeking her. It was seeking her approval, seeking her uh, attention. And the same is true in regards to God. Or, we, or Who is seeking after God and His will in their life? And so we see here that there's a question there. Who is the one that understands, and truly the only one that does understand is the second part of that, those that seek God are the only ones that really understand. Verse 3 here in Psalm 14, they are all gone aside, they are all together become filthy, there is none that doeth good, no not one, while over here in verse 12 it says they are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable, that means of no real use. When something's unprofitable, ain't no need having it. It ain't no good to you. There is, <clears throat> there is none that doeth good, no, not one. And that's a direct quote uh, from verse 3 of Psalm 14. You know, it's a remarkable thing how so many uh, verses in the Old Testament are repeated in the New Testament. You know, God's Word, we, can di we cannot dismiss uh, the Old Testament. It's just as important to us today as it was when it was first written to that generation. But we see here that they are all gone aside. In other words, they've went their own way. They are all together become filthy, unclean, you might say. 
There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So we see that phrase again about those uh, not doing good. We see man is corrupt or filthy. This speaks to man's will. Man chooses not to understand God. Man chooses not to seek God. God says none, no, not one, that meets his definition of good or righteous. What we see here is a dumbed-down world. And so now we go back over here to Romans. And we're going to jump down in Romans chapter 3 to verse 19. We look at verse 19. I'm, I skipped over, uh, you know, like I said, a lot of verses. And, you know, Brother Scott gave me a lot of time here. So uh, y'all really in for it. Hopefully I'll get done by 15, 28 or anyway. But let's just, y'all can pray that way. I don't have a problem with that. Because I don't know if I can last much longer. But nevertheless, verse 19. Let's look at verse 19, chapter 3 of Romans. He says there, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. You know, Paul over there in the previous chapters talked a lot about the law. You know, that's what... They, You've got to understand his audience that he's writing to, the Romans. The Romans were some of the most educated people of that uh, time that Paul wrote a letter to. They were the more educated people. They were in the central part of Rome and Italy there where the empire was, and so they had the best uh, opportunities, you might say, in life. But he wrote it to the Romans, but he's writing it to all who come to the knowledge of Christ or seek to come to that knowledge anyhow. But... He says here, talking about the law, he says, We know that what things, soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. You know, again, that goes back to the Jews. The Jews were under the law, the Gentiles weren't. But that doesn't change the truth and the righteousness of the law. You know, even today, uh, you know, if I went to another country, uh, I might not know what the laws are, but I'm still under them. I still have to obey them. I might be ignorant of what they are, but I still have to obey them. And so even, uh, that's like our country here. The laws of our country, our constitution was based upon the Bible. And, and you know, a, a God-fearing people is what it was based upon when they wrote the first laws of this land. And so, you know, we can look at the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not kill, of course, is most prominent. Of course, that's against the law to do that in the legal sense. And there are many other laws in, in, in God's Word that transfer over into our society today. But we look at the law here. It says, We know what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. What we see here is all the world is guilty before God. Well, that's not an easy thing for people to accept. It's not easy for me to accept that I'm guilty. Uh, in any way, you know, even as a child, I didn't want to accept that I was guilty. Uh, I tried to deny it. Even now, I try to deny my guilt when I'm found guilty of a situation. You know, it's it's sort of a, uh, you go into court, and I can have a video of somebody doing something, and I go into court and say, how do you plead? I plead innocent. I got a video of you doing it. I still plead innocence. Nobody wants to admit their guilt. But the fact of the matter is, Paul says here, in respect to being good, in respect to God's law, God's will, and that's what God's law represents, is God's will for a righteous people. He's saying here that the all, again, that word all, a little three-letter word, all the world, every man, woman, and child, may become guilty before God. We're all guilty before God. You know, and that's one of the first things <clears throat> when I, I got saved when I was 15, so I was relatively young. But I have to be honest with you, up to that point, I had never went to church. I didn't know anything about God. I didn't know things about the Bible. I didn't know about Jesus Christ, really. I knew a little bit about God. God's going to uh, reward me if I do good, and the devil's going to get me if I do bad, and that type of thing. That's about all I knew about God and the devil and anything else religious. I, I was not raised in church. So, I did not know I was guilty of anything. Hey, I thought I, hey, I wasn't as bad as him. That was how I would look at things. I'm not as bad as he is. I don't tell as many lies as he does. 
I don't steal as much as he does. I'll just tell you a little story here. <clears throat> I don't know how old, I was probably about five years old. Mama took me up to the store and double O Duncan's and went to the city of Kentucky. Went in there, my mom, you know, she was doing her shopping. I walked over there, them little metal cars. Remember little die cast metal cars? About this big. I got me a couple of them, put them in my pocket. I like one of a few of them babies. I got outside the door, and you know how it is. I got them now. I'm outside the store. I'm going to start playing with them. Where'd you get them things, boy? I had to go back in there and give them back to them. My mom made me go in there and give them back to them. So even as a five-year-old, I was a thief. I'm guilty, okay? Even them little five, all oh, my precious little grandchildren, they don't do wrong. Yes, they do. I got a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a two-year-old. Now, the two-year-old can get away with a little more right now. I can still say he don't know no better. But he knows a lot more than you give him credit, I can tell you that. But we're all sinners. We have a sin nature. And that's why we're all guilty, as he said here. All the world may become guilty before God. But he's talking about the law, and he... And, and, we read verse 20, it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. That's the first time we've seen that word in our study tonight. And that basically means made right. Uh, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be made right or justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. You know, all the world's guilty before God. And... When we see here the, the latter part of that, we, we read in verse 20 there, therefore by the deeds of the law. What are the deeds of the law? It's our works. It's our human actions. It's what it's talking about when it talks about the deeds of the law. It's not necessarily talking about our obedience, just every action we take. Because, you know, every action we take has a right and a wrong nature to it. Whether it's our motives or whether it's the actual action. We see here in verse 20, that it says, no flesh shall be justified in his sight because the law is not going to justify you. No man is justified or made right by his own actions or the law. The law merely puts light or light upon or reveals man's failure. That's what he's saying here. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified for by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. You know, it's like I was talking about them uh, uh, going to another country, not knowing the laws. I don't know what the laws are. It might be different. There's some laws, just common sense, okay? Blowing grass in the road with your lawnmower. Talked about that last Sunday, didn't I? I didn't know there was a law against that. Now I pay attention to everybody cutting grass. I went by down there at my house, fell blue grass out in the road. I started to stop. Say, Citizens rest! But when that sheriff's deputy came up to me and said, uh, did you blow that grass in that road? It's pretty obvious. I had a lawnmower sitting on the back of my truck there. I said, yeah. He said, well, I could write you a ticket for that. I said, well, I didn't know there was such a law. I'd heard there might have been, but it didn't make sense to me. I mean, what else am I supposed to do with that grass? But I got realize there that next time that cop comes by there, that deputy, he's going to look at that yard see where that grass is. I won't be there, but that's a whole different story probably. He might chase me down, go look up the tax records and write me a ticket. But I didn't know there was anything wrong until I was in, informed. And that's what the law does. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. You know, that's just like your kids. You tell them you can't do that. You know, there's many a time when they were growing up, you said, no, no. Even, even before they uh, could talk, they barely walking. You said, no, no. Trying to get into them to understand that you don't do that. And that's why I say that two-year-old knows a whole lot more than you uh, want to give him credit for. You've told him, he's been told no a lot of times in some of the things he continues to do. But he can't help it. You turn your back, he's going to do it. 
we are a lot like that even as adults, ain't we? But we see here that the law reveals man's failure of sin before a holy God. So now we're beginning to see why we need justification. And we're going to get into the gist of it here in just a moment. Verse 21 of chapter 3 reads, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. You look at that verse 21, how's it begin? But now. But now. This is in contrast to what else he's already been saying. And he says now, that means right now, pre, uh, presently. It don't matter what it used to be, it's what it is now. Didn't used to be a law to blow grass in the road. Somebody made up that law, so that's now the law. I'm going to have to obey it. I don't know when they come up with that. But, but Paul says, but... So we see Paul's answer to man's sin and separation from God. His answer to God's uh, problem with the world being guilty. But now the righteousness of God, and that's what we've been talking about when we're talking about good, and there is none good, talking about righteousness. But now the righteousness of God, man we've already established has no righteousness. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. It ain't got nothing to do with the law. It ain't got nothing to do with anything else other than what He's about to say here, it's manifested, it's revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law pointed to it, the prophets pointed to this direction. The law done its job, it revealed man's fallen nature and hopeless inability to please God. Everybody failed under the law, whether they admitted it or not. No one kept the law in its completeness. He says, but now... The righteousness of God is manifested. It's opened up. It's revealed. Verse 22 says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. This righteousness is by faith in Jesus Christ to all men. So God sends out His righteousness and offers His righteousness in the place of our unrighteousness. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of or in Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all, every man can receive this righteousness if he chooses. That believe, it says. All them that believe, for there is no difference. It doesn't matter here, Paul, again. As, uh, is the apostle to the Gentiles and the Jews. He's the apostle to all men. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and that's to all men. But he says, hey, it don't matter who you are. This righteousness is available. Verse 23, he again reminds us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, you ain't got, no matter what you do, you've come short. The best you can do is not enough to please God. For all have sinned, that means transgressed and rebelled against God and God's will and God's word and God's law and come short of the glory or the pleasing of God. And now I'm going to talk about this justification thing, and this is what we're really hitting right here, is the justification aspect. In my commentary, written by Warren Wiersbe, he makes this statement here. I'm going to read this. I, I copied it down. I didn't copy it exact, but this is basically what he's saying. First, he says, justification is the act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner righteous in Christ on the basis alone of the finished work of Christ on the cross. Let me say that again. The act of God, and God doesn't do with me, the act of God whereby He, God declares, the believing sinner, must be a believing sinner, righteous in Christ on the basis alone of the finished work of Christ on the cross. It's all 
from God through Christ and through what Christ done at Calvary. He also said justification is an act, not a process. You know, we think of sanctification as a process. I, I'm, I'm working on getting more holy, getting more uh, closer to God. That's sanctification. But justification is an act by God, not a process. There are no degrees of justification. You don't, well, I'm a little justified. I'm a bunch justified. I've been saved for... Can't add now. Forty-four years. Forty-four years. Y'all add it up. Fifteen, forty-four is fifty-nine. Forty-four years! But I'm no more justified today than when I went to that little church over here on Bethel Church Road and I fell on my knees and asked Jesus to come into my heart. I'm no more justified. I got justified right then all the way. And that's the thing we need to understand about justification. We all have equal justification that are believers. We need to understand justification is of God, not at all by man's actions or man's thinking. No one can justify himself before God. Oh, many people might try. A lot of religions, as I mentioned last Sunday, a lot of religions in this world, that's what they're looking for. Your works, your goodness. Does your good outweigh your bad, so to speak, is what this world looks at as trying to please God. That ain't so. That's not the Scriptures. I'm reading it to you straight out of the Scriptures here. And I'll continue reading it to you. Of course, this is man's words right here. need to understand justification does not mean God makes us righteous, but rather that He declares us righteous. Remember, we are all guilty sinners before a holy God. In a legal sense, God puts the righteousness of Christ on our record in the place of our sinfulness. You go look at my record? Go ahead and look at my record sometime. I've got a few little marks on it that you could probably look up somewhere if you want to dig deep enough. But you go look on my record when it comes to God. God's got his own record. And then now all that right there, all that sinful stuff Barry Jones done up till he's 15 years old. <laughs> slapped right over the top of it, the righteousness of Jesus. I woke a few of you up there. That's a little trick I learned. But in a legal sense, God puts the righteousness of Christ on our record in the place of our sinfulness. And it can never be changed. Can't nobody change it? I can't change it. Can't nobody change it. Once I'm justified, I'm always justified. God looks on us and sees Christ's righteousness is what we're saying here in regards to justification. Justification, as we read up there in verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, is by faith. Faith. That's a big word. You know, there's a lot of big words in the Bible we just throw around. We don't think about them much, but we need to think about them. Faith is that one word, and there's another word here in just a moment I'm going to talk about. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's that other word I just love to think about is God's grace. What was, what's it say there in the first part of verse 24? Being justified freely. Freely. It didn't cost me nothing. There ain't nothing in this world really free. I'm going to tell you that. You know, you get that free stuff on the internet, free internet, or free uh, use of this stuff. Oh, we'll let you on here free. You can use our app for free. No, they put a bunch of advertisement and all kinds of garbage on there and aggravate you to death. There ain't nothing free in this world, but let me just tell you what. And one thing is free, and that's our justification, our salvation, it's free to us, mind you. Justified freely. It's free to us, but it costs Christ his life. Then we also read in this verse, being justified freely by his grace. It is God's grace 
which means the unmerited favor of God. It's an undeserved thing we're receiving here. We don't deserve it. We haven't done anything for it. It's the unmerited, undeserved favor of God. And then he says we are redeemed through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That word redeemed means bought with a price. I don't belong to myself no more. I've been bought. It don't sound good in this world. We're talking about slaves and all that. I'm not a slave, mind you, unless I want to be a slave. I chose to serve my Lord. I'm not a slave. I'm a servant to my Lord. I am redeemed. I am bought with a price. And the last part of that says, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Paul says that so many times, in Christ Jesus. Verse 25 whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, another one of them big words, through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Christ is our propitiation. In a sense, that's the payment of the price. He is our payment. We receive, and it says here again, through faith. In other words, believing in, acceptance, of Christ's redemptive work at Calvary. Now we'll jump down to verse 28. Well, I'll go ahead and read verse 27. Uh, it says, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. In other words, you ain't got nothing to brag about. You didn't do nothing to get this. By what law? By what law? No, nope. law didn't do me no good. Works? Nope. It says nay instead of nope. But by the law of faith. That's what I'm going to boast about. It's what Jesus done for me. I can't boast about me, but I can boast about Jesus and His righteousness that He's given to me. Then verse 28. Therefore we conclude. It's always good to hit a conclusion to the matter, ain't it? Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Justified by faith without works. You want to hear more about that? You can turn over to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, where it says this. For by grace are you saved through faith. Pretty much what we've been talking about, ain't it? And that, not of yourselves. Again, what we've been talking about. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. Then again in verse 9, he says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. So you want to boast about something, it ain't your works to boast about. Verse 10. This is an important verse here, not always quoted. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I don't work for my salvation. My salvation gives me the desire to work for Christ. Now we'll go down to chapter 5. We ain't doing too well, I'm sorry. Chapter 5, we could stop there, couldn't we? Y'all heard enough? I'll go through this quickly. Verse 5, verse 1. Chapter 5, verse 1, rather. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. That means reconciliation. In the garden, Adam's sin became an enmity with God. And every man, woman, and child since has been an enmity with God but when Jesus Christ came to this earth, died on the cross, he gave us the opportunity to be reconciled to God. And so that's what he's talking about here. Adam in the garden before the fall, through our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. Verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So we have access. We have an open line of communication to God Again, it's by faith. It's the grace of God. Again, it's undeserved. It says there we stand, wherein we stand. That means we got a place. We are accepted as a child of God. We have a place in God's plan and God's family. We can rejoice in hope, it says. Rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We can rejoice in hope or our expectation. It's not hope so. It's an expectation. It's already guaranteed. I'm just waiting for it to happen. And that's the hope that we have. And we can rejoice in it. All this is to glorify God. That's why God saves us. 
That's why God made us in the first place. That's why he made Adam and Eve and every man since is to glorify his name for who he is. Our responsibility is to brag on God and his amazing grace that has brought our salvation and our justification. Verse 3 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Verse 4, And patience experience, and experience hope. So we see here in these two verses, God did not save us to be silent or still. God is still working on us, making us, molding us, strengthening us, maturing us into vessels that are usable. That's the gift of our justification. God wants to use you. How many of y'all want to be usable? God is wanting to make us usable. And that's why these things come into our lives. Tribulation worketh patience. And patience worketh experience. And experience hope. You know, if you've been there and done that, you ever said that to somebody? I've been there and done that. I know all about that. Hey, it don't bother you near as bad next time you see it, do you? It don't bother you. Hey, I've already been through that. I know what that's about. But if you ain't been there before, oh man, that can get scary. But if you've been there and done that, hey, I, already, I, know, I know all about it. It's going to be all right. You know what I can do with that? Exactly what Brother David done with our pastor in regards to that open heart surgery. He can tell him all about it. And the pastor testifies to that. How David's been a blessing to him. Telling him, hey, it's okay, buddy. I've been there. It's, it's okay. Exactly what happens. You're okay. It's okay. You know, and that's good. We can help others with our experience. And we can give them hope also. Verse 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. That's the gift. Another gift of justification. We also get God into our beings through the Holy Ghost and we can experience the love of God through the Holy Ghost. Verse 6 says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for me and he died for you even though we were born 2,000, some 2,000 years after he was crucified. He knew, he looked down through time, and he said, there's a little snotty-nosed punk named Barry Jones that I'm going to save one of these days, and I'm dying for him. And you can put your name in that same place. Verse 6 tells us that he died for us, for the ungodly. Don't want to call yourself ungodly, but you are. Verse 7 for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Would you die for any other persons outside your family? Most of us would say, well, you know, it would be hard. I don't think so. Some have. So many have. But that's when you truly are sacrificing your life for someone else. That's what Christ done for us. You know, you think about the people that Jesus died for, that at one time hated his guts. I wouldn't have anything to do with him. I don't want to hear nothing about it. Well, we're, we're, re we're reading the words written by someone just like that. His name was Paul. Back then, he was called Saul. But he changed his mind about the situation, didn't he? And what did he learn? Everything we've read here tonight, he learned it all. Verse 10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Verse 11, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. You know, we need to consider these things, and I say all this tonight. You know, I'd, I'd like to give you a good, real encouraging, uplifting message, and lesson. Maybe I'll do that in a couple weeks. If y'all want to come back in two weeks, I'll be teaching again. Preacher's going on vacation that week. I told him, can't you find another preacher somewhere? He said, I don't know none. That aren't pastors already. He said, I trust you. I don't know why, but he did. He might change his mind. I may not be teaching it too quick. But nevertheless, 
We'll sum up tonight's lesson. And we'll say we need to thank God for His amazing grace in allowing us to believe. Is the amen because I'm finishing up? Everybody had an amen on that one. We need to thank God for His amazing grace in allowing us to believe and accept His redemptive work at Calvary. And we need to understand our faith will bring our justification and salvation or deliverance from our sins before a holy God. It's by faith. By faith. Faith alone. Grace alone. We are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. So let us praise and glory to God. And while we were singing that song at the cross, it hit me. I think I'm going to read these verses. You know, we sung them, but did you pay any mind to them? I don't pay much mind to songs. I just sing them. Sometimes I do. Amazing grace. I, I, I know every word of that thing, and I listen to every word of it. But nevertheless, let's read. Uh, verse 2. Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Is that why he went upon that tree? Amazing pity. Grace unknown. I didn't know about God's grace. And love beyond degree. What Jesus done for me. I'm going to add the stuff in there. I'm going to become a songwriter for it's over with. Verse 4. It says, but drops of grief can never repay. Ain't nothing I can do to ever repay. The debt of love I owe. Do you understand that? Here, Lord, I give myself. Tis all that I can do. That's all we can do. All right, Lord, here am I. Use me. Just like Isaiah said. So as we look at this song, I think it's, a, it's amazing how God uses people to write these songs that just basically teach His Word to us if we just pay attention to the songs. Of course, some of them are garbage, but that's another story. Let's go ahead and dismiss in a word of prayer. I appreciate y'all's attention tonight. Dear Lord, we come together here tonight giving thanks for this opportunity to open up your word and to partake of a reminder, Lord, of your amazing grace, your justification through faith. How, Lord, you gave your righteousness in place of our righteousness or our unrighteousness. Help us, Lord. We have no righteousness, we know. Help us, Lord, to realize who we are. No one can be saved till they realize that they're a sinner in need of your mercies and your grace. And we pray, Lord, that we, Lord, will be a light and that, Lord, we would boast not of ourselves but of you, Lord, in our lives when people ask. Thank you, Lord, for saving our unworthy souls, for giving to us your great salvation so rich and free. In Jesus' holy name we humbly pray. Amen.